So instead of having a board, I'm going to try to use my iPad this block. So once again, let me know if this doesn't show up or if you have a hard time reading this. Um, my writing is not good on the board. It's not good on an iPad either, but I'll try to make things as legible as possible. And so what is economics? And honestly, there's probably two commonly understood definitions. The old school definition, right, kind of the traditional view of economics, is it's the study of how societies distribute scarce resources. This is kind of the, the, as I said, the old school definition of economics. So when I took my first economics class, I was told, well, economics is about how societies distribute scarce resources. So there's resources in our society and there's not enough for everybody to have as much as they want. So how do we decide who gets what? That's really kind of the old version, the old school style of economics. So who gets what, right? Why are rich people rich? Why are poor people poor? Why do some people have um, a lot of production? Why are some people able to produce more than other people? Why do some people have high wages? Other people have low wages? You know, that was kind of the traditional view of economics. Mm -hmm. I actually don't think that's a particularly good view of economics, and, and partly because this really focuses on kind of material things, right? This view of economics really focuses on the material. It really focuses on, you know, kind of income and money and wealth. But one of the things that we'll see in this class is that economics is more than just about money and it's more than about wealth. It's also about behavior, right? A lot of what we're gonna talk about is just why people behave in the way that they do. And so the definition that I prefer is this definition, which is really that economics is the study of how people respond to incentives. In other words, instead of thinking about economics as the study of who gets what, I think a much better way of thinking about economics is thinking about behavior, thinking about the way that people behave. Sorry about the banging, you can probably hear that. <laughs> um, so thinking about the way that people behave, right? Why do people behave in the ways that they do and how do they respond to incentives? So for instance, um, in Brazil, Brazil has adopted what's called the Bolsa Program. And in the Bolsa Program, Brazil gives to households $50 a month. In return for that $50 a month, all the families have to do is send their kids to school and make sure they get vaccinations. That $50 a month has doubled school enrollment and has increased childhood vaccinations from 30% of the population to 99% of the population, right? So that economic incentive of $50 a month has decidedly changed behavior, much more, quite honestly, than economists anticipated. And so that's the kind of question that I think econ that economics can help us understand. How is it that such a small economic incentive can change behavior? right? And thinking about the many ways that incentives shape behavior. Just a, another example. One of the things we know that in Asia, there are roughly about 100 missing women. If you look at the demographics of Asia, particularly India and China, you'll see that there are about 100 million women who are missing from their populations. Why? Well, we know this, right? Female babies have been selectively aborted based on their gender, right? Why? 
why is that kind of behavior taking place in India and China? To understand that, you have to understand the incentives to have male children over female children. Economics can help us think about that, right? Not to say that economics is the only way to think about that, but economics is a way to understand these kind of behaviors through thinking about incentives. And so, as I said, the reason I like this, old, this new school definition is because, as we're going to see, economics is a lot more than just about income and wealth and money. It is about how people behave, right? It is about, about how people behave. And so that's really going to be the focus of this class is to think about behavior. Now, in this class, we're going to be focused on a specific kind of behavior, though. For those of you who have taken microeconomics, <clears throat> you'll likely know that microeconomics is about individual behavior. So micro, as the, the name suggests, is about individuals, right? It's about the small scale. So in microeconomics, you talk about individual goods, individual prices, individual industries, individual firms. How does Joe decide how many gallons of Kool-Aid he's going to drink, right? How, how does Jill decide how many hours she's going to work? How does Microsoft decide what price they're going to put on, you know, a software license, right? These are the kind of questions that you get in microeconomics. So microeconomics focuses on individual behavior. In this class, we are really talking about aggregate behavior. So we're really talking here in this class about how economies as a whole, how big groups of people operate. And as we're going to see, um, this has its advantages and disadvantages. Right? <laughs> One of the big advantages of macroeconomics, at least in my opinion, is that macro really has a lot of interesting questions. Right. I mean, I think a lot of what we talk about in this class, um, I think I consider, but not just me, I think most people consider to be very, very interesting questions. And so let's actually talk about this uh, in your syllabus. In the introduction. I have what are called the six big questions. And so let's talk about the six big questions from this class. So the first big question that we're going to address in macro is why are some countries rich and some countries poor? Right? Why are some countries rich and some countries poor? So, a U.S. worker earns in one day what it takes an Ethiopian worker 80 days to earn. Okay, I'll say that again. In one day, a typical U.S. worker earns what it takes an Ethiopian worker about 80 days to earn. So, a U.S. worker is in a day earning almost three months wage for an Ethiopian worker. How in the world do we explain that? How do we explain these huge variations between the rich and the poor when it comes to different countries? One of the things that we have seen is that it's not just the case that we have rich countries and poor countries. We all have, also have poor countries that are becoming rich, such as China. China, 
has moved about 300 million people from extreme poverty, right? Extreme poverty is defined as basically living on less than $2 a day. The number of people living on less than $2 a day. And China has moved $300 million, I'm sorry, 300 million people above that poverty level. That's a population almost the size of the United States, right? It is one of the biggest events in human history, right? Undoubtedly, it's one of the biggest events in human history. How has China done that, right? That's a, a fascinating question. But of course, we have countries that have gone from poor to rich, but we also have countries that have been poor and stayed poor. And we also have some examples of countries that were relatively rich and have become poor. So there is a wide diversity of experience when it comes to, to rich countries and poor countries. <clears throat> One of the things that we'll talk about in this class a lot is something called the citizenship premium. What's the citizenship premium? The citizenship premium is what happens to your income when you move from one country to another country. Right? The change in income that you can expect by moving from one country to another country. So usually we think about this in terms of the Congo. Why? Because the Congo is the poorest country in the world. But if you move from the Congo to the US, what happens to your expected income? Income rises by a factor of 92. In other words, you become 92 times richer on average if you move, migrate from the Congo to the United States. What happens if you move from the Congo to Sweden? your income goes up by a factor of 71. You become 71, your, your average income is gonna rise by 71 times. What about Brazil? Thirteen times. What about Yemen? three times. What is this telling us? <clears throat> this is telling us a couple of fairly obvious things. First off, there is an immense amount of income inequality across the world, right? There is an immense amount of income inequality across the world. But at an even deeper level, this is telling us that where you live is really important, right? In fact, as we're going to talk about, I only need to know one thing about you to predict most of what your income is going to be, and that is where you live. Where you live is the most important determinant of what your income is going to be. So that is interesting to us, right? One of the things that I think as Americans we're often taught is that, oh yeah, you know, it's about you and your individual hard work and incentive and you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, I hate, don't hate to tell you this, I'm just gonna tell you this, most of you have already won the lottery because you were born in the United States. By being born in the United States, you are almost certainly guaranteed to be one of the richest people in the world. Maybe not one of the richest people in the United States, but one of the richest people in the world, right? So where you live is a huge factor in how much income you make. And this also explains the incredible incentives to migrate, right? So we'll talk about migration later, but you can imagine what kind of incentives this creates for migration, right? 
that it, this helps explain why people are willing to risk their lives and to go through horrible circumstances for an opportunity to migrate from a country that is poor to a country that is rich because there are huge economic incentives, setting aside other incentives, but just huge you know, income incentives to, to migrate from one country to another. So that's obviously gonna be one of the big things we talk about in this class is how do we explain all this income inequality? We're also gonna talk about some other things. We're gonna talk about inflation in this class, right? So remember, this is a macroeconomics class, a class about aggregate behavior. Inflation is the aggregate price level. Actually, I should say this better. I should say inflation is actually changes in the aggregate price level. Inflation is changes in the aggregate price level. In other words, the price of all goods and services within an economy. And so inflation, if you read newspapers, particularly if you read newspapers today, one of the big talks about that, that's going on in the, um, the news is what about inflation? Right, because we're beginning for the first time in a long time to see some evidence that inflation has actually gone up. Well, why should we be worried about that? What's causing that? What's causing changes in the aggregate price level? We will talk quite a bit about that. We'll talk about the causes of recessions and depressions. One of the things that we see within a, an economy is that it's not always true that spending is equal to production. In other words, sometimes we have these big mismatches between how much we produce and how much we spend. And what that can lead to then is declines in economic activity. And a decline in economic activity is what we call a recession. And a particularly bad recession, we tend to call a depression. So um, look at this figure here. This is from your book. Hold on. Let's see if I can pull this up. Okay, can you all see this PowerPoint? This is figure 6.1 from your book. But this is looking at output, right? How much the US economy is producing. And it's from two different lines. The orange line, or I'm sorry, let's talk about the purple line. The purple line beneath is what happened to industrial output during the Great Depression, okay, in 1929. And you can see that this, this index of industrial output began at 100, but pretty quickly, by th well, not super quickly, but by 39 months in, had fallen to about 60%. So we basically, production fell by 40% during the Great Depression. We were producing 40% less goods and services um, at, the, at the, the bottom of the Great Depression as we were at the beginning of the Great Depression, right? That is a classic recession or depression. The orange line up on top is what happened during the Great Recession of 2008. And what we see there is a much, uh, a much less daunting picture. Notice that the, the recession of 2008 looked a lot like the Great Depression at the beginning, right? The, the paths are actually pretty close. But then where the Great Depression continued to get worse and worse, the Great Recession, actually we had a bounce back, but it was a very, very slow bounce back. We'll spend a lot of time talking about both 2008 and the Great Depression, but this is you know, a, a classic question in macroeconomics. 
we know that growth takes place on average, right? On, over time, the US economy has gotten richer, but we haven't gotten richer at a stable pace. Some years we've had big growth and other years we've had collapses. And so this volatility of economic production is a really important question for us. You all know this from COVID, right? Um, if I can show you an index here of what's happened in COVID, hopefully you can see this. It's, this didn't copy, it's kind of blurry on my screen. But this is basically looking at um, GDP growth. The blue line is GDP growth over time. And you can see, um, this is for the world, okay? This is not just for the US, this is world. GDP, as we're gonna talk about, is a measure of aggregate income. And so you can see where world growth over the last 30 years or so has actually dipped, um, particularly during the dot-com crash and, and um, when was that, 2000 dot-com crash in 9-11, in right, in 2001. You can see the 2008 Great Recession, right, the financial crash in 2008, and then here you can see the COVID decline, right? So the COVID decline actually is amongst the biggest recessions we've had in the U.S. history, right? In many ways, it was, it was as sharp, if not sharper, than the Great Depression. Um, of course, one of the things we'll be talking about in this class is what happens after COVID, because now we this, this data doesn't have any data from 2001, but if we, if we had data from 2001, we'd see that there's, gonna, there's actually a lot of evidence to suggest we're going to have a very strong bounce back. And so, you know, all of these are questions related to recessions and depressions and trying to understand why they occur. When we talk about recessions and depressions, we're also going to talk a lot about monetary policy and fiscal policy. All right, so a lot of this class is going to be focused on monetary and fiscal policy. When we talk about monetary policy, what are we talking about? The Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve's ability to control the money supply that influences interest rates and other aspects of financial performance. And so for many of you, I imagine that when you hear the words Federal Reserve, that's just like a black box, right? Those are just words in which you have really no idea what that means. <laughs> and you shouldn't, you know, I think a lot of people come to, to intro the macro and have no idea what the Federal Reserve is. Well, that's one of the things that we're going to talk about, right? Is what is the Fed? What exactly does the Fed do? What are the objectives of the Fed, right? And so we'll talk about that in some great detail. And then we'll also talk about fiscal policy, which involves government spending, tax policy, and government debt and deficits. So we're all familiar, given that we live in the time of COVID, We've, we're all, or hopefully somewhat familiar with a lot of the big fiscal policy debates that have been going on in the US here recently. Um, for instance, the stimulus checks, right? These were um, basically designed to try to stimulate, to try to stabilize people's income and stimulate spending, right? What's the theory of that, right? Changes in tax policy, right? How exactly could that be used to prevent recessions or, or not? And then, of course, debt, right? Because if you are spending more and you're not collecting more in taxes, you have to borrow the money. And so we'll have, we will talk a lot about how exactly debt and deficits work. In fact, we talk so much about that that this really merits its own separate question.
what are the dangers associated with deficits and government debt? So we'll talk about, on one hand, why countries should be worried about borrowing as much as they do. Um, the US uh, government last year borrowed an equivalent, essentially borrowed 10% of total income in the country. That was how big our deficit was. About 10% of the total income of the country is how much that we borrowed. Should we be worried about that? Um, some people say yes. Actually, there's a very reasonable argument not to be worried about that. Right? And so we'll talk about what are the dangers, and then we'll also talk about why some people are, are much more uh, or much less worried about government debt. And then finally, the last question that we'll spend a lot of time talking about in this class is international trade. Is international trade and globalization beneficial? And so, uh, not to give the, the game away, but we will spend, or I'll spend a fair amount of time <laughs> trying to convince you that in fact, international trade is one of the most important factors that makes rich countries rich that countries that engage in more trade are richer. And this data here is actually a data point to support that. Here we have a graph of different regions of the world. On the horizontal axis, we have what your level of income is. And on the vertical axis, we have how much you trade. And what we see is that countries in regions of the world that trade more grow faster, right? They are richer. And so this is a strong belief amongst the communists, that the more you trade, the richer you are, right? And so we're going to want to talk about why, right? Why exactly is that? Why is international trade so important to increasing standards of living, right? And so we, we will talk about that in great detail. So those are the, the big things that we talk about in this class, right? Those are the, the six big questions. And I hope, <laughs> I hope that you find those questions somewhat interesting, right? And you kind of think, oh, I would like to learn more about those things. And so, yeah, you know, for those of you who have taken microeconomics, which is a lot of you, in my experience, and this is not to denigrate my friends in microeconomics, but I think most people find that macroeconomics is more interesting than microeconomics. <laughs> and of course, I'm a little biased because I'm a macroeconomist. But I do think that most people who take this class really do find what we talk about interesting because it's relevant to the real world, right? So one of the good things about this class is it's interesting. Now, let me talk to you about one of the challenges of this class, though. <clears throat> one of the challenges of this class is when you think about those six questions, there's often not a clear answer to those questions, right? That amongst economists, there's actually fairly, fairly significant disagreement about the answers to these questions, right? Economists disagree somewhat about what makes countries rich and poor. They disagree much more about why we have recessions, and they disagree even more about the role of monetary policy and fiscal policy in preventing them. So economists disagree a lot, right? And in fact, that's one of the, I, I think kind of the stereotypes of economists is that they disagree, right? There's this old, there's this old, there, there's tons of jokes about economists, right? Um, for instance, the writer George Bernard Shaw said that if all economists were laid end to end, they still would not reach a conclusion, right? <laughs> Harry Truman once said, that he wanted a one-handed economist because he was tired of all his economists saying, on one hand this and on another hand that, right? <laughs> um, let me throw this out to you. Why do you think that there's so much disagreement amongst economists, right? Where, where, why can't economists always come to a simple answer for all of these, these questions? Any ideas? Yeah, Bryn. 
Not one economist can have all the information in the world. That's true, right? <laughs> That's true. I mean, certainly information is hard. Um, one of the things that's great about the age that we live in is we do have more information now about economic performance than we've ever had before, right? Faith says, uh, growing up in different countries with different economic policies, yes, right? That's actually getting at something really important. What, what big advantage does, do chemists have over economists? Yeah, Evan. Um, chemistry is pretty much the same everywhere, um, but in different countries, uh, economics are gonna be different. Yeah, right. So maybe to put that in another way, uh, chemists have the advantage of working with chemicals. Economists have the disadvantage of working with people. <laughs> we have different people, different cultures. Right? We'll, we'll actually talk a little bit about the role of culture in economics. But yeah, people are different. People are not nearly as predictable as carbon, right? And I think that is definitely part of this, right? That is definitely part of this. I, I think there's, there's something else going on that makes economics harder than chemistry. What's the kind of the cornerstone tool of chemistry? or really of all the natural sciences. It's the first thing you learn when you take a natural science. Yeah, some people are saying chemistry has fundamental truths or there's no right answer. Yeah, Logan. Is it that like you can conduct like experiments in science and like you can test and retest things and exactly. like if we want to test something in our economy you can't just get congress to pass a bill right and you certainly can't get everybody to do exactly what they're doing and congress is going to tweak one thing and then let's just watch and what happens right i mean the big difference is controlled experiments right in chemistry you keep everything else the same you change one thing you watch what happens that you know the nature of chemistry is the controlled experiment in macroeconomics, we have nothing like controlled experiments, right? You can't, as Logan says, you can't just ask Congress to say, let's give everybody a stimulus check and then see what happens to the economy. And then everything that happens to economy, attribute it to that stimulus check. Because the problem is there's millions of things going on in the economy at once, right? You can't separate one thing from another thing. And so that tends to be the reason why economists tend to argue about things, right? <laughs> is that, you know, you can bring data to this. And of course, economists try to control for these other things. And we do have techniques. But in reality, we will never have a controlled experiment in the same way that they have in chemistry. So that is a, a, a huge impediment, right? That's a huge impediment. So to kind of recap some of the things that we've talked about here, if I can do this. Why is so much disagreement in economics? Because we have, oops, I put this in. Why disagreement? Because we don't have perfect information, that we're working with people, that we don't have controlled experiments. And then briefly, I think there's a couple of other things that make economics challenging, macroeconomics in particular. Macroeconomics, we're dealing with groups of people. But one of the things that we know is this problem of fallacy of composition. In other words, what's true for an individual
is not necessarily true for a group of people. Okay, so for those of you who have taken microeconomics, one of the things that we'll talk about is that a lot of things that you learned in microeconomics don't actually hold in macroeconomics. Let me give you an example of the fallacy of composition and then we'll, we'll turn it to economics. Um, here's a good example of the fallacy of composition. Let's say that I tell you all that we're gonna, I'm gonna grade this class on a curve, okay? Meaning that 10% of you are gonna get A's, 20% B's, 30% C's, 20% D's, 10% of us. Okay, if I'm grading on a curve, can you as an individual do better if you study more? Sure, if you study more and everybody else in the class doesn't study more, you should do better. But what happens if everybody in the class studies more? Will you necessarily do better? No, no, because you're graded on a curve, right? If everybody studies more, everybody will be, do better but because you're graded on the curve, you won't necessarily get a better grade, right? That, in some sense, is the fallacy of composition. What's true for you as an individual isn't necessarily true for a group. And so, um, you know, example of this in macroeconomics is the complex relationship between savings and spending. What happened at the beginning of COVID? At the beginning of COVID, everybody got scared. Right, if you remember where we were a year ago, everybody was scared. What's gonna to happen to the economy, right? You're scared for your personal well-being, but you're also scared. What's gonna to happen to the economy? So what did people do when they started to get scared? They stopped spending and they started to save. But what's the problem if everybody starts to save at the same time? If nobody is spending, then people lose their jobs. And when you lose your job, you can't save more. <laughs> so counterintuitively, it's not possible for an entire economy to save more at the same time. Because if, you, if everybody tries to save more, many people are going to lose their jobs, they'll lose their income, and they can't save more, right? That's an example of fallacy of composition. What's true for an individual doesn't really make sense in the aggregate. And so that complicates our thinking in macroeconomics. That complicates our thinking. The final thing that, that creates some confusion in macroeconomics, and this is not just true for macro, the micro, is this whole question of what is fair. Right? What is fair? Fairness is, uh, I would say, I think there's a lot of evidence that we are born and bred to expect a certain amount of fairness from each other, right? And, and we'll actually talk about some studies in economics that suggest that people value fairness very importantly in their decision making. But what actually counts as fair differs quite a bit from person to person. Does LeBron James making $40 million a year, is that fair? Well, in one sense, it is fair because the market has determined that his playing basketball is worth that much money. In fact, it probably, he probably doesn't get paid enough because of the salary cap, right? So in, in some sense, yes, it is very fair. But then in another sense, when you think about the value of basketball players versus, for instance, the value of an elementary school teacher, that doesn't seem very fair, right? And so these are really two different questions of fairness. One, one is a question of what the market thinks something is valued, but another is the question of what society should value things at. And that, of course, always gets wrapped up in economic questions, right? Is, you know, these questions that in some sense are outside of economics and deal with philosophy, right? What is just? What does a just society look like? What does an equal society look like? What does a fair society look like? So we, we will talk about that, right? We will talk about that a little bit. But, you know, in, in general, you know, economics can only get us so far in some of these questions, right? That a lot of, a lot of questions in this class, we will come up against the, the brick wall 
of just you know differences in people's opinion about what fairness should look like in the real world. So anyway, that's why um, economics is is confusing. So many students find this challenging because unlike chemistry, we're going to have a number of questions in this class that we don't have simple answers to. Um, you should not always expect to walk away from this class knowing the right answer to these six questions, right? And so our focus in this class, though, is not on getting the right answers. Our, question, our focus is on addressing the question in a systematic manner, thinking critically and systematically about these questions. And to some extent, understanding both sides, right? Understanding, for instance, on the question of debt, why debt might be scary, but why debt may not matter. Right? In many ways, that is what we're trying to do in this class, is to understand both sides of the question. In other words, to become critical thinkers and more discerning consumers of information. And quite honestly, that is the most valuable thing that you will get from economics. Right? Um, people who take more economics and go on to an economics degree, very rarely do they go on and become economists. Right? They don't usually go on to work as an economist. What do they do? They go to law school. They go to medical school. They go to other graduate schools. You know, economists are always consistently amongst the most in-demand majors, even though very few people work as economists. And why is that? Because I think most people understand the value of economics. The value of economics is not in knowing facts. The value of economics is in thinking critically and thinking systematically. And so that ultimately is going to be, you know, kind of the, the skill that we want to develop in this class, right? To think critically and systematically about how people respond to incentives, right? That's what we're going to try to achieve in this class. Okay, well, that was a bit of a long introduction, and that kind of took us a little bit longer than I wanted, but... Thanks, Chris. I like that. <laughs> okay, let's let's just take a little break. Um, maybe let's just take a five minute break. So let's keep it short because we will wrap up by eleven o'clock. So um, yeah, take a little break. We'll be back like about let's see ten seventeen by my computer, and then we will uh, begin talking a little bit about supply and demand. All right, see you in a couple minutes. And by the way, I'm going to leave this on so that if anybody wants to chit chat, you're happy to chit chat. I'm just going to mute my video. Okay. All right, hey everybody. So, you know, if you're feeling kind of gray about having to take classes online and in the blockade and having to do all this again i just tell you that during break i went out and the guys are up working on my roof in the rain <laughs> and so it could be worse right we could be up on a roof getting rained on um <laughs> right there there's worse jobs in the world than learning online and teaching online so anyway always always kind of good to remember that uh yeah it could always be worse Maybe that's, maybe that's the most important thing that we've learned this year, is that it could always get worse. <laughs> so um, what I want to do here for the rest of the morning and also this afternoon is um, kind of do a little bit of, I won't call it review because some of us have never taken microeconomics, but kind of an overview of some very important principles of, of, that you learn in microeconomics that we're going to use a lot in this class. And specifically, two things. The, the idea of supply and demand, which we'll talk about today, and then the idea of comparative advantage, which we will talk about tomorrow. Okay? So, supply and demand is going to be what we talk about this morning and this afternoon. Supply and demand will also be the focus of your quiz number one that we will take tomorrow afternoon. Okay? So it's good that many of you have had some exposure to supply and demand. I, I suspect even those of you who have not had an economics class have had some exposure to, to supply and demand. So that's good. But we, I want to make sure that you um, 
you know, you have a little bit more than exposure to this, but we need to understand the principles of supply and demand because this will be a tool that we use a lot in this class, right? Is appealing to the basic concept of, of supply and demand to explain some of the things that we observe about the real world. So for those of you who have taken a microeconomics class, um, looking through chapter three of your book may not be that important, or you might be able to just kind of browse through it. For those of you who have never taken an economics class before, you probably want to spend a little bit more time um, working in chapter three, reading through chapter three and going through some of the end of chapter questions. And let, let me say this about the end of chapter questions, not just for this chapter, for all chapters. I've put the answers to all the questions at the end of the chapter on Moodle, okay? And I will try to be in the practice of telling you some of the questions at the end of every chapter that would be good questions for you to work through if you want to work, want to practice, okay? So I'll kind of remind you of this later, but I, I think that it's a good practice in this class, not just to take the quizzes, but in terms of getting prepared for the quizzes to work some of the questions at the end of the chapter, particularly working, working these questions with, with some of your classmates, right? Because I think talking through these and trying to, to do these questions more actively is a really good way of, of self-testing about whether you're understanding the things that you think. And so as we get to every chapter, I'm gonna be giving you questions at the end of the chapter that I think you can work through. You can work through them by yourself. You can also work through them with other people. I'm happy to let you hook up with people. Um, I'm also, if, if people are looking to find other people to do questions with, you can always reach out to me and I'm happy to be kind of the matchmaker, right, for this. But, um, but working through questions and problems is always a very good way to prepare for these quizzes. And so quiz number two, uh, tomorrow's gonna be on supply and demand. And so, or most of what we talk about tomorrow is gonna be, or on quiz number two is gonna be about supply and demand. And so that's what we're gonna spend um, the rest of the morning here and this afternoon talking about, okay? So supply and demand. <clears throat> As I said, most of this is from chapter three of your book. <clears throat> so when we talk about supply and demand, what are we talking about? We are talking about prices. Because supply and demand is really about how do markets determine prices? How do markets determine prices? So if, if I asked you, or I will ask you, why are doctors paid less than baseball players, professional baseball players? Why is that? Because it's the uh, market value. It's the market value, right? Can we, can we be even more specific? Why, why does the market value of someone who can play baseball professionally more than a more than a, a doctor would it be because uh like baseball players are entertainment to people uh yeah well i mean i i think that's an idea uh the problem is like street performers are uh, entertainment to people too right and they don't get paid 40 million dollars so I'm not sure it's that. Professional baseball brings in a lot of money. Like when COVID wasn't with how much ticket prices are. So they're making a lot more money. So they're able to pay the players a lot more money. They're making more money than the medical industry? No. Medical industry is about 20% of total production in the United States. So no, there's no way that, that baseball or sports or entertainment is nearly as big as medicine. Would it be there's a lower supply of baseball players that can actually play professionally? Exactly, right? It's about supply, right? It's really a question of supply. There's relatively few people that can, um, that can play baseball professionally right? Relative to the number of people who are 
competent and smart enough to be doctors, and there's not very many of them either, right? It's really the same reason why is that why are diamonds, why do diamonds have higher prices than water? It's not, it, it, it's not that we don't need water. In fact, in terms of value, we need water more than we need diamonds. It's a simple question of supply relative to demand, right? So the reason why I wanted to begin with this is to emphasize this point, that when we're talking about prices, it has nothing to do with value. It has nothing, prices have nothing to do with value, right? And by value, I mean, the actual you know, contribution to the quality of our lives or society, right? Listen, there's no way that a, a you know, guy who runs a hedge fund on Wall Street is more valuable than a kindergarten teacher, right? <laughs> At least in my opinion, right? They're not more valuable, but value doesn't really have anything to do with prices, right? And if you don't believe that, then just listen to Taylor Swift. <laughs> I think her music has zero value, right? But she is rich as you know what, um, right? Prices have nothing to do with value. And so prices really reflect simple supply and demand. And so if we're gonna understand prices, we really have to, to to understand supply and demand. Now, where supply and demand come together is what we call a market. By the way, sorry to insult you Taylor Swift fans out there, nothing personal. <laughs> you, you wouldn't like my music either, so. <laughs> All right, so, so what is a market? A market is just a collection of buyers and sellers. Right, a market's just a collection of buyers and sellers. So markets can have a physical location, like they would have like in an auction, um, like they have in the New York Stock Exchange where people actually physically come, can come together to trade stocks, or more and more they're virtual, right? Where basically buyers and sellers can connect um, online. Now, markets can take many different shapes and forms, okay? Um, in fact, there's as many kinds of markets as there are markets, right? Every market is a little bit different. And so for those of you who have taken microeconomics, you've you spent a lot of time talking about different types of markets. But for our purposes, I would just like to talk about kind of the two extremes and be a little bit familiar with two extremes. And these are opposite extremes, markets that are kind of one extreme and the other. The one extreme on one side is what we call perfectly competitive markets. Perfectly competitive markets. These markets, as the name suggests, are perfectly competitive. They're hyper competitive. What do you have to be to be a perfectly competitive market? Well, economists generally agree that a perfectly competitive market would have three things that's true about it. First, all the goods are the same. In other words, it's homogenous goods. All the goods are the same. Second, there's a large number of buyers and sellers. Right, there's a large number of buyers and sellers. And third, everyone is a price taker. And by that, we mean no one controls the price.
everyone's a price taker. No one controls the price. If a market meets these three criteria, we would consider it to be a perfectly competitive market. Okay. So let's think about an example of a perfectly competitive market. Um, the market for feed corn. Right? We live in Iowa, so let's talk about corn. So or we go to school, at least virtually we go to school in Iowa. <laughs> um, so let's talk about corn, right? So when you go outside Mar Mount Vernon, you'll see the corn fields. They're fallow right now. Pretty soon you'll be seeing the corn grow up there. What kind of corn is that? That's basically feed corn. It's not really, the, it's not really corn that uh, we can consume. Uh, humans consume, consume. I mean, we can consume it, but there's really not very many calories in it for us because we, it's really not, I don't know why I'm getting into all this. I, I guess I figure you should know this if you're going to college in Iowa. But it's, it, there's actually very little nutrients in this for humans, but it is the kind of corn that you can first turn into high fructose corn syrup and or you can feed cows, right, or other other livestock. And so what's the thing about, you know, this feed corn? Well, if you're a farmer in Iowa and you grow some feed corn, you harvest it in the fall and you take it down um, to market. And uh, the guy at the market says, well, feed corn is selling at 625 a bushel. And you're like, you know what, my, my corn is a little bit better. Than that I think I really deserve 725 a bushel uh, what's the guy gonna tell you screw off right you go go find somebody that's gonna pay you 725 right because the good is homogenous as a practical matter that good is homogenous my corn is the same as somebody else's corn also there's a large number of people that can make that kind of corn and that, can, and that can buy that kind of corn. So you're not reliant on any one seller or any one buyer. As a result, nobody controls the price. The price is really set by the market, right? So in a perfectly competitive market, nobody really has any power. Buy, buyers don't have any power, or at least one buyer doesn't have any power, one seller doesn't have any power, the market determines the price, right? That's kind of one extreme of a market. The opposite extreme would be a monopolist. Where you have one seller that's selling a unique good and it sets its own price. That's kind of the opposite extreme. So a monopolist might be, you know, for instance, um, somebody uh, who owns the patent to a drug, right? Right, so you own a patent to a unique drug you're essentially, with that patent, you become a monopolist. The government has given you the right to become the only seller of a unique good, and you get to set the price as you want. Why does the government give patents? Because they want to create an economic incentive for companies to innovate, right? And so it creates a big economic incentive because when you have power to set your own price, what are you gonna do? You can jack up prices. Now, as I said, in reality, most goods are not really one of these extremes. They're somewhere in between, right? They're somewhere in between. So, you know, let's think about Apple, right? Is Apple a monopolist? Well, they're not a monopolist because there's Samsung phones and there's Google phones that are substitutes. But then again, they're not exactly the same thing as an Apple phone. But Apple certainly is not a perfectly competitive market either. So, you know, when you think about the market for cell phones, it's probably neither of these. It's probably somewhere in between. 
it's more likely what we would call monopolistic competition, which we won't talk much about in this class, but for those of you who have taken micro or will take micro, you'll talk about that a fair amount. So, you know, most goods, whether you're talking about cell phones or whether you're talking about the COVID vaccine, are not monopolists, they're not perfectly competitive, they're somewhere in between. But it's good for us to kind of understand these two extremes. Now today, I wanna to focus on the perfectly competitive market, okay? So in, in our discussion here this morning, I'm gonna assume that our market is perfectly competitive. Why? In, some, in part because um, it's simpler, right? <laughs> and in part because um, you know, the, what we can learn from perfect um, competition tells us a lot about all of the markets. So let, let's think about a perfectly competitive market. Let's assume we have a perfectly competitive market. Okay. Let's talk about demand and supply. What do we mean by demand? Oh, dang it. Sorry, didn't mean to do that. All right. Demand summarizes the actions of buyers within a market. So when we talk about demand, we're really talking about buyers of a good. So usually when I teach this class, I, you, for this you know, opening example, I pick a good and for whatever reason, in the past, I've always used beer. And it seems like that's kind of a stupid example. What, what, should, what kind of good should I use? And so I got to thinking this morning, like, hmm, all right, what, what kind of goods are popular, right? What kind of goods are popular? So I was like, hmm, let's think about Etsy. What's the most popular good on Etsy? Anybody have any idea what the most popular good on Etsy is? <laughs> Uh, this might disturb you, but the most popular good on Etsy is cat stickers. I kid you not. <laughs> cat stickers like this. <laughs> stickers are the number one good on Etsy, right? And what are the number one form of stickers? Cat stickers. I don't, I don't know why that disturbs me so much, but yes, that is the number one good on Etsy. So let's think about an example of your demand for cat stickers, okay? Right, so you have a good cat stickers and you're thinking about buying some cat stickers. I don't know how, I can, how many times I can say cat stickers. That sounds like, stickers is kind of a weird word. To my ear but anyway <laughs> cat stickers right <clears throat> what's going to determine how many cat stickers you buy help me out what's going to determine how many cat stickers you buy Anybody? Anybody got anything? Oh, the price of each sticker. The price, yes. Definitely the price. I see somebody in the chat also put how much money you have. Yes, your income. What else? Logan. If they're like a good enough quality, so like, not just is it a bad sticker that's gonna fall off, but like is it a good quality sticker? Right, yeah, quality. Um, like the size of it maybe? Like if it's like a huge sticker, maybe you're only gonna buy one. Sure. But if it's like a bunch of small stickers. 
Right, we'll put that with quality, right? Or characteristics. Um, what, your tastes. For instance, do you have taste or not? <laughs> <laughs> if you have taste, you may not want to buy cat stickers. Uh, I hate to insult, insult Americans, but I'm, I'm doing it, right? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a number of things that could potentially influence, right? Yeah, I mean, as Sonny says, how many you need or want, right? I mean, I think that's really a question of taste, right, or preferences. Maybe that's a nice, nicer way of saying this. What I'm trying to get at here is that there's a number of things that could potentially impact your demand for cat stickers. How are we going to keep all these things straight? Well, the way that we do it in economics is we make the assumption of ceteris paribus. In other words, we make the assumption that we're going to hold everything else being equal. And that's what we do when we create a demand schedule. Demand schedule essentially says, how does my quantity demanded of a good change as the price changes? Ceteris paribus. And ceteris, ceteris paribus is essentially economic shorthand um, for all else equal. All else equal. So keeping everything else equal, how does my quantity demanded of a good change as the price changes? So I'm gonna assume that my tastes stay the same, my income stays the same, the quality stays the same, all of that other stuff stays the same, and I'm just gonna talk about how price changes my quantity demanded. So let's say I do a little experiment. I'm not gonna use myself, but I'm gonna use my, I'm gonna use my mom who I would say is probably somebody who would be very interested in getting some cat stickers, right? So here's my mom. Here's my mom's demand schedule. And let's say at a price of $3, she would buy 10. At a price of $4, she's going to buy seven. The price of $5, she says she would only buy five. Price of $6, she's going to buy two. And the price of $7, she's out. She will not pay $7 for a cat sticker. Notice here that as the price goes up, the quantity demanded goes down, ceteris paribus. And once again, that's the key assumption here. Everything else being equal, when the price goes up, people want to buy less of it. This is kind of a, this demand schedule, quite honestly, is an awkward way of prevent, presenting information. And so how economists typically present this information is instead of putting it in a schedule, we put it in a curve. Okay. Where we plot out, we make a visual or a graph that essentially plots out 
the relationship between price and quantity demand. So what did I just say here? At zero, if the price is $7, then my mom wants zero. No, no, I'm sorry. Price of $10, my mom wants zero. At a price of $7, oh gosh, I can't read my own. Start this over. At a price of $7, my mom wants zero. At a price of $6, she wants two. At a price of $5, she wants five. At a price of $4, she wants seven. And at a price of $3, she wants 10. Okay, so I've just plotted out this information. And if I connect the dots here, I have an individual demand curve, which is basically a graphical representation of that demand schedule. What do, we, what do we observe here? That this demand curve is downward sloping. And that is a pretty common assumption in economics. In fact, it's not really an assumption, it's something that we consistently observe. We observe this so consistently that we actually call this a law. And this is referred to as the law of demand. The law of demand simply says that demand curves slope downwards. Right, that the vast majority, for our purposes, all demand curves slope downwards. In other words, as the price goes up, quantity demanded goes down. Why? Why is this? Can we be more concrete or more specific in our thinking? Why is it that when the price goes up, we want to buy less of something? Hmm. Anybody help, help me out? Can we, can we be very clear about why that is? Faith says that people want to want things when they're cheap. Would you rather buy a shoe for $2 or $20? Hmm, okay, so can, can we dig down into this a little bit deeper, Faith? Why do people want to buy more of things when they're cheap? Can we get, get down to that even a little bit deeper? I want to buy for cheap because then they have more money to spend on other things right just, it costs less of their total overall money for the good right right so in other words when things get cheaper you actually can afford to buy more of it based on a fixed income likewise when things get more expensive and your income is fixed you can afford to buy less of it this is what we know as the income effect The income effect says on a fixed income, On a fixed income, you can only afford to buy less of it. 
<clears throat> so there, there's um, quite a bit of economic research that suggests that in our everyday life, we all do a lot of mental accounting. For instance, while we, while we may, may never be as specific to ourselves as this, we often say like, hmm, how much do I have to spend on clothes this year? Um, I can spend 5% of my budget on clothes, $500. That's how much I am allocating to spending on clothes, right? And so what happens if I see a pair of boots that I really love that are 250 bucks? That's gonna take a huge fraction of my budget, right? What happens if I find a similar pair and they're 200 bucks? Well, <laughs> that leaves me more money for other things, right? And so, like I, like I said, I, I'm not saying that we think about things this concretely, but there is some evidence that people actually do these kind of financial accounting. They allocate their income to specific needs. And so, yes, when the price goes down, it really leaves you more money to buy other things. That's really the income effect, right? That's the income effect. I think there's a second reason, though, why when the price goes down, you want to buy more of it. Or when the price goes up, you want to buy less of it. Anybody kind of think of a, another reason? Yeah, Logan. You don't want to miss out on the opportunity of it being a lower cost, potentially? Hmm. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't. I don't usually think that's that is a big reason. <coughs> think. It, let me give you a specific example that might make this a little bit more obvious. Um, this time of year, usually there's <laughs> there's worries about what happens if there's like a cold snap in Florida. What happens to the orange juice market, right? And what happens if Florida gets really cold? Then oranges are going to be killed. Orange trees are not going to produce fruit. And what's going to happen to the price of orange juice? It's going to go up, right? When the price of orange juice goes up, what are people going to do? Buy less orange juice. What do they do instead? They buy more grapefruit juice, or they buy more apple juice, or they buy some substitute, right? And so the other reason why demand curves are downward sloping is because of the substitution effect. And in practice, this is probably the even more important reason why demand curves are downward sloping, right? Sunny, you, you said this, I'm sorry I missed you in the chat. Yeah, you spend on an alternate good, right? A, a substitute. And so when price rises, people switch to a cheaper substitute, right? So if orange juice goes up in price, you drink apple juice for a while. So these are two reasons why we, we believe that demand curves slope downwards. In other words, when price goes up, quantity demanded goes down, okay? Now, remember though, here's the important part. Demand curves are based on ceteris paribus, all else equal. So that demand curve, the only thing that's changing is price. Everything else is the same. Right? Everything else is the same. What happens if something else changes that impacts demand? What happens if something else changes that impacts demand? Okay. 
that creates a shift in demand. Meaning, that's what we call a change in demand, right? A change in demand or a shift in the demand curve. So essentially when something other than price changes, it completely changes to a new demand curve, right? It changes to a brand new demand curve. That old demand curve disappears and you have a new demand curve, right? So let's think about some things that shift demand. What are some things that shift demand? Well, these are some things that change other than price, right? Other than price. So we've talked about a couple of them just a minute ago. A change in income, right? What if income rises? What do we think is going to happen to that demand curve? Right here, we're still talking about the market for cat stickers. So let's say my mom comes into some money, right? What's she going to do? If she, if she wins the lottery, she is going to buy more cat stickers, regardless of what the price is, right? More, as, as Sonny says, more money, more cat stickers, right? Plain and simple. So if income goes up, you would expect her demand to go up, meaning that at every price, she's going to want to buy more cat stickers than before, right? At every single price, she's going to want to buy more cat stickers than before. For my mom, cat stickers are what we call a normal good. A normal good is just a good in which when income goes up, demand goes up. And we call it a normal good because most goods are normal goods. But there are some goods that are examples that are called inferior goods. And an inferior good would be when your income goes up, your demand actually would fall. So if we were talking about the market, not for cat stickers, but the market for ramen noodles, ramen noodles might be, and I'm talking the ramen noodles that you spend a quarter on at the grocery store, right? Th those would probably be inferior goods, meaning when you have more money, you don't eat as much cheap ramen noodles, right? So not all goods are normal goods, but probably most goods are normal goods, right? When income goes up, your demand goes up. Once again, the key thing to this though, is notice how the old demand curve essentially disappears and you have a new demand curve, right? Because something other than price has changed, right? Something other than price has changed. What are some other things that shift demand? Um, well, we talked about a change in tastes or quality, right? Okay, so this is a very hypothetical example, but imagine an imaginary world in which cat stickers were actually cool, right? Cat stickers are trending, right? <laughs> if cat stickers suddenly become cool and everybody wants to buy them, what would we expect to happen? We would expect the demand curve to shift, meaning at every price, people want to buy more cat stickers. Right, at every price, people want to buy more cat stickers, right? I know it's an it's a extreme hypothetical example, but, you know, that would be an example of how a change in taste or quality. Um, a couple of other things. Sometimes for goods, there's changes in usefulness. Uh, in this cat sticker example, it's hard for me to understand. <laughs> I don't even know if I can come up with a hypothetical example of how cat stickers become, could become more useful. But you know, um, certainly 
let me extend this example out to, to COVID, right? One of the things that we've seen during COVID is that a whole bunch of goods have seen their demands go down and a whole bunch of goods have seen their demands go up, right? Because different goods have become more or less useful as a result of COVID. So I have a friend who runs an outdoor store, right? Surprisingly, COVID has been great for his business. Why? Because because of COVID, it's people want to spend more time outside, right? So selling canoes and kayaks and tents, demand for all of that stuff is through the roof, right? That stuff has become more useful to people, right? Has become more useful to people. Um, sometimes for goods, you'll find that there's a change in the number of buyers meaning that more people will buy the good than before. <clears throat> How would this apply to our cat sticker example? Well, um, I'm going to be completely stereotypical here. But let's assume that most of the people who buy cat stickers are like my mom. They're older. And so what happens as we have an aging population? Well, that could actually change the demand for cat stickers, right? Because there's more older people who are more likely to buy cat stickers. Right, so that could be example of how the change in the number of buyers because of demographics, for instance, um, could change demand. We're getting running close to the end of our time here. If you could just give me a couple of minutes, um, we'll, we'll finish this discussion up. One last thing that I think it would be really useful or, or very important in determining demand is the change in the price of other goods. particularly goods that are substitutes or complements. When it comes to substitutes, an increase in the price of the substitute is actually going to increase demand. Okay, so if there's cute dog stickers, if the price of cute dog stickers goes up, right, um, that's likely to cause some people to say, oh, I can't afford cute dog stickers. I'm going to buy more cute cat stickers. Okay. So an increase in the price of a substitute is going to typically increase demand. Substitute or complement, though, is the exact opposite. A complement is goods that go together, right? Goods that go together. So if there's an increase in the price of a complement, that would reduce demand. What's a compliment to cat stickers? Um, maybe like uh, Nalgene bottles or water bottles, right? That's what people tend to put cute stickers on. So what happens if the price of water bottles go up? Well, if the price of water bottles go up, people will buy fewer water bottles. As a result, they're going to buy fewer stickers as well maybe, right? Or if you want another example that's probably more, more, more closely related, think about the price of chips and salsa, right? If the price of corn chips go up, what's going to happen to the demand for salsa? It's going to go down, right? Because if corn chips go up in price, people will buy less corn chips. You cannot eat corn chips without salsa. It's a physical impossibility, and so the demand for salsa will go down, right? So this is not to say that this is all the things that shift demand, but these are just some examples of things that shift demand. Let me just summarize this by, by talking about or making clear the difference between a change in quantity demanded and a change in demand. Because these are two different things. Right? A change in quantity to demand it comes from a change in price.
and it comes from a movement along the demand curve. So what happens when price goes up? Our quantity demanded goes down. We would call that a change in quantity demanded. It comes from a change in price and it moves us along the demand curve. But this is different than a change in demand. A change in demand is a change in something other than price. And it shifts your demand curve. So in other words, your demand curve, the one that you have disappears and you move to a higher one or you move to a lower one. Okay, so it's really important to keep these two things separate. A change in price is treated much differently than the other things that could impact demand, right? So a change in price is a movement along our curve, right? But the curve remains. A change in something other than price essentially gets rid of the old curve and creates a new curve, right? So those are kind of the basics of demand, right? Those are kind of the basics of demand. So I'm sorry for going over. I, I usually will be better about going over than I am today. I, I think I just got a little long-winded. So um, this afternoon, I wanna come back and we talk about supply and then I wanna do some problems, all right? So we're gonna break into some small groups and do some supply and demand problems in preparation for our quiz this afternoon, okay? So I'll let you go now. We'll meet back at 12.30. Um, also, at, after class this afternoon, I know that a number of you are um, going to miss class tomorrow because of the baseball game. So I want to talk to you all. Um, actually, if, if, you got, if you would all have a minute, those of you who are on the baseball team, if you would stay around on Zoom and just let me talk with you, uh, that would be great. Okay, so um, baseball players hang out. And then everybody else, um, I'll meet. You, I'll see you back here on Zoom at twelve thirty. Okay, and we'll talk about supply and do some problems. Okay, thank you very much. See you, everybody. Uh, for our game tomorrow, it actually uh, we're not playing tomorrow. Our coach said it most likely is going to get moved to Thursday. To Thursday. Okay. Yeah. Well, then let's talk about this on Wednesday. <laughs> okay. Um. If, if something changes and you guys do end up playing tomorrow, I don't know why I'm still sharing this. <laughs>